He's best known for founding Court TV in 1991, but journalist Stephen Brill has made both the law and journalistic accountability his passion over the years. Now, he, along with CNN's Jeffrey Tubin, have launched a new Netflix series, Trial by Media, focusing on sensational trials and the media coverage that might have manipulated the outcome. Steve joins me in a minute, but first, a taste of the series. I found out early on as a lawyer, it doesn't matter about the law. It's about <laughs> being able to tell a story. Trial by Media focuses on six cases that all became a relentless part of the news cycle. Nobody had committed murder as a result of being on a trash talk show. During the 1995 taping of the Jenny Jones talk show, a gay man revealed he had a crush on a male neighbor. A few days later, the neighbor murdered the gay man. But the show itself then went on trial. Your purpose in doing this show was to sensationalize, embarrass, humiliate with regard to sex. Isn't that true? That's completely untrue. Each of the episodes focuses on a singular sensational case with daily media coverage. The Bernie Getz subway vigilante, where he shot four young black men after they approached him for money. I wanted to kill those guys. Then there's former Illinois Governor Rod Blagojevich, on trial for trying to sell the Senate seat vacated by Barack Obama. The defense team wanted to put him on TV and make a national personality out of him because they saw the OJ case, the R. Kelly case. How about taking a picture with me? Here? And as celebrity attorney Jeffrey Figer puts it, cameras in the courtroom afforded lawyers like him the best possible justice, the court of public opinion. If you're going to be successful in front of a jury, you've got to make the story compelling to a human being. Court TV founder and trial by media co-executive producer Stephen Brill joins me now. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you. This is really quite the trip down memory lane looking at some of these really sure. old trials. It was amazing. You know, when I first uh, uh, looked at it and I thought, well, the, the, the title trial by media, I thought it was going to be sort of the media predicting or manipulating the outcome, but not really, right? No. What, what we try to stress is that the lawyers uh, think about the public perception of a trial, and I think they use how the media uh, covers a trial as a proxy for what the jury is going to think about the trial, or in some cases they may use how the media covers a trial as a way to influence how the jury is going to think about a trial. Well, certainly Jeffrey Feiger, who was, of course, well known first as uh, Dr. Kevorkian's attorney, and then he right. uh, became involved in the in the Jenny Jones trial. He admits it, you know, straight, straight up that he's a showman in that Jenny Jones trial. I had forgotten this. His opening statement went two and a half hours, and he right. knew he, he had a captive he, audience. Right, but what he leaves out of his interviews with us is that he lost the case. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. He that that was interesting because he he was actually saying that Jenny Jones was guilty, right? He was trying to right. say that. Well, he, he what he was trying to make is the very logical argument that um, that basically being on that show and being exposed um, drove this guy crazy enough that he went and killed the other guy. Yeah. And his argument was, you know, uh, uh, reality TV shows. You know, don't have the right to murder anyone. But, you know, there's a long slippery slope there. If you start punishing people or if you start punishing uh, people using the First Amendment, however badly, uh, for the reactions that other people have to what you do and say, uh, you know, God knows where that stops. What I remember actually most about the fact that Court TV covered that trial is the pressure I got from Time Warner, who were my lead investors in Court TV, not to cover that trial. Hmm. So uh, cameras in the courtroom started around 1980. In fact, Boston was one of the trial markets for that. And there was a big murder case. I remember, you know, sending cameras down to cover that. How do you think, and now all these years later, that cameras have affected behavior in the courtroom? We definitely saw it in the O.J. trial, which is not part of your series right now. Maybe it'll be later down the road. But h how has that affected, you know, behavior in the courtroom? Well, I think that it really hasn't, because if you think about uh, what a camera in, in the courtroom does, is it simply shows people outside the courtroom what the jurors are seeing. That was the idea uh, behind court TV, nothing more, nothing less than that. So, you know, if you say that the OJ trial was affected by cameras, I'm not even sure I agree with that. I think 
the media circus outside the courtroom is what everybody thinks of. The lawyers, you know, standing on the courthouse steps and giving interviews is what everybody thinks of. You think that trial would have gone nine months if it wasn't on television every day? Yeah, I think the prosecution was incompetent enough that they still, you know, would have cross-examined the medical examiner for five days or something um, if the cameras weren't there. The only one who arguably played to the cameras was this judge. really nice guy, the judge. Yeah, judge Ito. <laughs> yeah. So I was... I didn't realize one of the one of the pieces, one of the uh, trial by media pieces about uh, Rod Blagojevich, the former governor of Illinois. He was eventually convicted of trying to sell the Senate seat once uh, held by Barack Obama. But I didn't realize that his his attorneys were advising him to make almost like a buffoon of himself. He was sort of clownish. He was giving all these interviews, you know, joking about his hair. Um, yeah, no, I, I, mean, I had forgotten gonna... that too. And what you also probably had forgotten is that the first trial ended up in a hung jury. I did forget that. I totally forgot that. <laughs> so how did you decide which uh, which trials you were going to pick for this? It's it's a limited series. There's six. There's uh, the uh... well, we've got a few more coming down the pike. We think, but what we tried to do, what Jeffrey and I tried to do, was to uh, uh, think of trials that a uh, you know were dramatic that in some way had a surprising or a suspenseful ending, as in, uh, you know, the first trial of the governor, uh, you know, ending in a hung jury, but also that, that told a larger story. You know, the Bernard Getz story told mm -hmm. the story of race relations in New York in that era and of uh, the crime wave in New York in that era. So um, uh, the Scrooge story was a story of white collar crime and, the effort, you know, to influence uh, the jury. So each of them had sort of a larger point, but in and of itself had, uh, you know, the kind of drama uh, that made me think to start Court TV in the first place. It's, <laughs> it, it's, it's the only, it was the only real reality television. It was nothing more, nothing less That's than true. everybody was saying in the courtroom. No spin, you know, no interviews with lawyers on the courthouse steps, just what the jurors saw. So your co-executive producer, Jeffrey Tubin, who you could argue got his start covering these trials on, you know, court because he's CNN, he says that this, um, this notion that the one-line summary that comes out of the media day after day after day is generally wrong. Is that he's true? He's absolutely right. He's absolutely right. Um, by example. Uh, by example, um, I hate to say it, I'm going to get in trouble for saying this because it's not the politically correct thing, but we carried the trial of the cops who beat Rodney King. Mm -hmm. And if you covered that whole trial, our people who covered that trial and anybody who watched the trial were not surprised by the verdict because everybody in the world saw the snippets of tape in that case where the cops were beating him senseless, about 18 seconds or something. But before that, he had been charging them and charging them and charging at them. Now, I'm not saying that these cops were angels, but it was understandable how the jury made the decision that it made. And in lots of other cases, um, you can watch a whole trial, as in the OJ case, and you could say, well, if that's not understandable. Something went wrong there. What went wrong there is uh, the competence of uh, the prosecutors, frankly. What about the Diallo trial? That was the, the young man, the African-American, who was killed by police in New York City. He was shot 41 times. I mean, it, it, it's, it sort of seemed like just unnecessary oh, slaughter. Agree. And it, and in my opinion, it was. But uh, the jurors, again, you know, the burden of proof is guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And there were enough of them who, who started out not thinking that the prosecution had met the burden. And ultimately, they convinced the others. I'm not saying that if you show a trial that every verdict is completely and perfectly uh, predictable and explainable. Actually, quite the contrary. It's not a perfect system, but it is a more perfect system uh, than showing, you know, the press conference of a prosecutor the day they make the arrest and they're standing in front of the American flag and they have the perp walk, you know, with the defendant in handcuffs. Um, that is certainly not a fair picture. That's true. And on the other side, having, you know, the defendant's uh, lawyers, you know, like a figer, you know, mapping <laughs> off all the time. That's not a fair picture. All right, Stephen Barrel, thanks. All six episodes of Trial by Media are available now on Netflix.